one other question I was going to ask you all. Has, has anybody had any trouble accessing the litchapala.org website? If you're looking for the videos, and perhaps even if you're looking for the link to the, the PowerPoints, you can always go there because uh, Carolyn is being very faithful to upload those as we go along. There, you can watch the videos actually on the the Instituto website, litchapala.org, and they have links right there. You can click and that'll take you to the box.com, which is where the material, the printed materials are. So litchapala.org is the magic address, so make sure you remember that. If anybody has any trouble with it, let me know, okay? Today, we are continuing with Old Testament theology in our discussion of the theology of the law. This is our sixth class of eight. Next week, we will deal with theology of Revelation. And that's not the last book of the Bible, Revelation in terms of God revealing himself. And then our last week, we will do the Old Testament fulfillment in Jesus Christ, and we will also do our test. I am working on all of the content that are going to, that's going to be included on the test. For those of you who are taking this for credit, we'll hopefully have that all uploaded this week and then have copies of it for you next week so that you'll have a little time to study that stuff. But it's not like you're, you're waiting and you can't already study because, because the materials that are uh, on the test have all been in the lecture. Almost all of them have been on the PowerPoint. So if you're feeling like you want to get started, then go back and start going through the PowerPoint materials because that will be the, the vast majority of the content that we're going to have. In fact, I would say that 95% of everything I'm going to put on the test is going to be in the power, something you've already seen on the PowerPoints. And then, I've, I've done this for one of the classes already, the first couple of weeks, I'm going to give you questions and answers, and everything that is on the test is going to be included on those sheets, all right? I get them to you as quickly as I can. Hopefully, I'll have them uploaded this weekend. Okay, John. so that'll give us like a week before the test? Right. Well, again, you don't have to wait till the week before the test. You can start studying right now, and hopefully you've been, you know, taking notes and thinking about this stuff as you went along. This will be a, a, an aid for you in the last week to get caught up on things. So today, the theology of the law. Let's talk about the law in the Old Testament, particularly the Jewish uh, understanding of the law. I want to start out with what the law means, talk about what it meant to the Jews, and then toward the end of the class, I want to talk about how Christians understand the Old Testament law. First, what is the Hebrew or the Jewish understanding of the law? When we say the law, most Christians, let me put this right out front, most Christians have a wrong understanding of what law meant to the Old Testament Jews. And I'll talk about that as we go along. The first, I'm going to give you at least four different understandings of what the Jews thought of when you said the law. First, there is the Torah, or law, or instruction, and I'm going to come back to that difference in a minute, which was made up of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, or what we know as the Old Testament, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They were called, as you've heard many times now, the five books of Moses, as well as being called the books of the law, or Torah. And the Greek name for them, which is the name scholars usually use, is the Pentateuch, which means the five books. Um, it's important to realize that when we talk about the, the five books of the Old Testament, uh, the Torah, the five, first five books of the Old Testament, when those books were written on scrolls for the Jews to use, the, to give you some idea how high a regard the Jewish people had, and for Orthodox Jews still have, for the Torah, a Torah scroll was considered to be a living thing. It had to be very carefully um, taken care of. You weren't supposed to touch it with your hands. They have special pointers, which would, they would be beautifully decorated, gold and pearl and stuff like that. Pointers in order to follow along where you're reading, as you're, if you're reading publicly from the Torah scrolls. If a scroll was ever found to have any sort of error, it was decommissioned. It was not allowed to be continued to use. If it ever got too worn to be used, um, or for any reason a Torah scroll could not be um, could not be used in liturgy, then it would be given a burial. They never destroy the Torah scroll. They don't uh, throw it out. They don't burn it. They bury it. In fact, the in 2 Kings, the story of Josiah, King Josiah, and they're renovating the temple, and they discover a scroll of the law. And, and they, they're saying, hey, look at this. You know, apparently they have lost at least part of Deuteronomy. 
they brought the book to the high priest. The high priest brought it to Josiah. They read it, and he tears his robe, realizing just how far away from God's will and the law they've gone. And they read it publicly, and it leads to a huge um, renewal of the faith of Israel under King Josiah, one of the perhaps best kings of Judah. And they believe that probably what had happened is old scrolls had been put, they actually had a special room in temples and in synagogues for old scrolls where they were buried. It's like a, it's like a burial vault, you know, a scriptorium. And they believe that probably some of the old scrolls had been put in this scriptorium, and then when they started renovating it, they sort of broke it open and found stuff that they didn't recognize, and that's where the finding of the law was in Josiah. But it, that's consistent with the idea that the, the Jews never destroyed a scroll. A scroll is considered a living thing. We talk about the living Word of God. Well, they took that very seriously. Okay? So the first definition of law is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, law, or instruction. A second thing that could be meant to the Jews when you say law was the law of Moses, or the Mosaic law that was contained in the Torah. See, well, the first definition is actually the existence of those five books, usually in scrolls, was considered the Torah. So you talk about Torah scrolls. But the law of Moses, the Mosaic covenant, sometimes just called the law, was what was contained in the Torah, in those first five books of Moses. You see the difference there? Is that clear? One is the actual physical presence of those books in a scroll form, usually, um, in ancient times, all, always. And then the second is the content that was contained in them. The third is the covenant agreement, that is the Mosaic Covenant or the Sinaitic Covenant, it's sometimes called Sinaitic because it was given in uh, the Sinai Peninsula um, between God and the Hebrew people that is articulated in the Mosaic Law. So the first one, number one up there, is the physical thing, which is the first five books. The second is the law, the rules, the instruction, the content that is in it. The third is the agreement that those, that content represented. When they talk about the law, sometimes it meant the relationship, the covenant relationship that existed between God and his people. And then the fourth thing that could be meant by a reference to the law are the six, 613 distinct commandments, or um, the mitzvot, they're called. We're going to talk about that, that are contained in the Torah. These are individual commandments from God that are contained in the book. Any one of those four things could be what the Hebrew people meant when they said law. They were all part of the Mosaic Covenant. So let me talk about that a little bit. And as always, you all will stop me if you have questions. First, the Mosaic Law, which was given at Mount Sinai, established God's covenant a special covenant relationship with the Jewish people. As I said, when you said law to an Old Testament uh, Hebrew, they could, have, they could have interpreted, based on the context, that you meant the actual scrolls of the five books. They could have meant the Mosaic law. They could have meant the covenant that the law represented. And so here, the Mosaic law, we need to understand, was itself the embodiment to the Jewish people of their special relationship with God. It wasn't just a, a code of conduct. The law told the Israelites what God expected of them and how he expected them to live their lives, the rules of conduct for their life, especially after having been slaves in Egypt and in preparation for becoming a new nation. For, for some significant period of 400 years that they were in Egypt, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, had been slaves and somebody else told them what to do all the time. They didn't have their own rules, they didn't have their own courts, they didn't have their own anything. Much of that time they were slaves. You know, under Joseph, they had been protected and well thought of, but after Joseph's death, apparently things began to decline uh, fairly immediately, so that by the time, you know, 400 years had passed from Joseph's, uh, from their entry into Egypt, they actually were slaves. They were bonded to slavery. And so they had never, they went from being a, a family, that is, Jacob and his sons and their, their, uh, Relations about 75 people, when they went into Egypt, they began to grow, but through most of that time, they didn't develop themselves into any sense of national identity. They didn't have their own laws. They didn't have their own rules. They really didn't know how to live without somebody telling them what to do. And so one of the reasons for giving of the law is was this, this was God's way of saying, okay, now I want you to become a nation. You know, this is the time where you're to become a people, not just a family, and you need to have a constitution, if you will. You need to have guidelines for how to live. And that's what the law represented. 
was God's instruction to them as to how they were to live so that they would become the people of God and not just a family, not just a bunch of relatives. So at Mount Sinai, God, through Moses, presented them with, these, with this law. And the Jews accepted the Torah and said, we will do and we will listen. That's the short version of the Hebrew response from the Jews. Because when Moses first comes down off the mountain, calls together the leaders of the, the, the tribes that were there, and he said, this is what God has said. This is what God is telling us, and this is what he's giving us in terms of instruction. And they agreed, yes, we will do this, we will listen, we will follow God. Moses went back up on the mountain in order to actually receive the particulars of the law, and was gone a very short time when they convinced Aaron to build a golden calf that they could worship. Okay. But they made a commitment. You know, there was a verbal contract very clearly established when, they, when the Israelites agreed that yes, they would do what God had said, they would listen to him. And then in rabbinic literature, I'm going to talk about that. Rabbinic literature is the writing of the rabbis or teachers over the last you know, almost uh, 4,000 years, 3,500 years at least. Um, well, not quite that long, 3,000 years. Um, because I wouldn't count as far back as Moses. In rabbinic literature, the Torah denotes, as I said, both the five books of Moses, the written, and they call that the written Torah, but they also have the oral Torah. In Hebrew, the written Torah, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are the Torah um, Shemichtav. Okay, I'm teaching you guys Hebrew a little bit at a time here. <laughs> The oral Torah is the Torah Shabel al Peh. What that meant was the Jews invested a degree of authority, not as much, but a degree of authority in the spoken law, which was the interpretation of the law from Moses on, all of the rabbinical leaders, all of their teachers, all of the people they believed were anointed by God to be their priests, their teachers, the leaders of, uh, you know, that includes the prophets. And those oral Torah were handed down from one generation to the next. You'll remember that at the time of Moses, the Hebrew people were not very far away from having been a purely oral culture. And we don't have any concept of what it was like in oral cultures where an everyday part of people's life was to memorize stuff, to memorize long passages of scripture, of books, of poems, of literature. Um, in fact, it's interesting that Socrates was opposed to writing. Socrates, the Greek philosopher, did not think that people should learn to write because he said, if you learn to write, you'll stop thinking. You know, you'll expect everything is going to be written down and you won't, you won't memorize, you won't learn. It will, you'll lose the power of the oral culture that had existed previously. Well, the rabbinic literature is all of both the written law, the first five books that we know of the Hebrew Bible, as well as all of the oral tradition of interpretation and commentary and everything else that went along with that in the, in the oral Torah. So when the Jews talked about Torah, there were two big parts to it. Now the oral Torah, the commentary by the rabbis down through the centuries, is not considered as authoritative as the, the written Torah, as the books of Moses. There's no child, nothing else touches the authority of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. And they, the Torah is seen as superior to the writings of the prophets and, and all the rest of the Tanakh, the Old Testament Bible, the Hebrew Bible. The first five books, the books of Moses, are the highest level. But below that, they do invest some level of authority in the various rabbis. Now, it can't be absolute authority because the rabbis frequently disagree with each other. You know, much of the rabbinic tradition where they're arguing with each other over stuff. And you get into cases where some of the great rabbis... You know, like um, Hillel had this running disagreement with, with, with the other major rabbi of his day over interpretation of how, you know, how we were supposed to focus on the Torah. So there was a lot of disagreement, but all of that is seen as part of the process. Any of you all ever see the, the movie, I mean, you young folks may not have, uh, Yentl, Barbara Streisand. You ever see that movie? There are a couple of wonderful scenes in there that give you a feeling <clears throat> like there's a scene where they're headed back to yeshiva. Yeshiva is a Jewish school. And they're all supposed to be young men. The story is that she wants to study Torah. She wants to study at the yeshiva, so she pretends she's a boy, dresses up as a boy in order to study. Because her father, before he died, had been teaching her at night, but women weren't supposed to learn Torah. <clears throat> so they're sitting in the back of this wagon on their way back to school, and they get, they've get they got the Talmud, which is part of the commentary, part of the oral Torah, which I'll explain in a minute, in a little 
And they're having these, this discussion, this argument, because the process of learning in the, in the Jewish yeshiva is to establish, to state a point and then argue it. And to refer back to what the various rabbis have said, pro and con in various ways. And they get in this big argument about when, you know, when is it night? You know, is it night when you can no longer see your shadow? Or is it night when you can no longer distinguish the features of another person? Well, the Sabbath started at dark. They started at the end of the day. And so the issue of when is the end of the day was a big deal because that was the way in which they weren't allowed to do any work anymore. And so, and you get this wonderful little scene going on there where you get a feel for what it was like in a yeshiva to argue those kind of points. And they're quoting different rabbis about, you know, but rabbi such and such said this, but rabbi, you know, you know, it's, and that's exactly what it was like for them because they have that long, huge, I mean, the Talmud is 6,200 pages over 6,000 pages in regular print of commentary and opinions about that. We'll get into some more detail. So, the Torah, the written, or I'm sorry, the oral uh, Torah, which is the Talmud and uh, some other writings, Mishnah and others, uh, went along with the written Torah, which are the books of Moses. Not as authoritative, but still held in very, very high regard. Okay? Questions or comments about that? It's really in it's interesting stuff. It really is. Are we going to have to know that Hebrew on this test? Um, well, actually, I'm probably going to expect you to know the Hebrew alphabet. No, you're not going to know the Hebrew. I've given this to you for, just for some context. Just so I'm, I'm not going to require you to know the Hebrew. I just want to there, everything there are a few Hebrew words you're going to have to know, like Torah, you know, <coughs> um, the other class, the, the Old Testament survey class. I'm expecting people to know Torah, Nevaim, and Ketuvim, the three big sections of the, the Hebrew Bible. And, because without that, you don't understand that the Bible is called the Tanakh, because the abbreviations of those three sections of the Old Testament Bible in Hebrew are pushed together to form the name of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. Okay, so there'll be a few words like that, but no, I'm not giving you this. I just do this because, I, you know, it sort of gives you a sense that this is real. You know, uh, Bob. Are these terms modern Hebrew or ancient Hebrew? They're ancient Hebrew and. There's not a huge difference between ancient Hebrew and modern Hebrew. Modern Hebrew obviously has a lot of words that aren't ancient because there are a lot of things that exist now that didn't exist back then. There's some words in ancient Hebrew we don't know the, we don't know the meaning of. But because Hebrew was a dead language, when they revived it in the 1940s with the establishment of the State of Israel, all they had was ancient Hebrew to start with. And so there's a very different kind of feeling I mean, a very different kind of relationship between, say, ancient Hebrew and modern Hebrew, which are fairly close, compared to modern Greek versus Koine Greek, which is the Greek that's used in writing the Bible, which was the sort of everyday common Greek back in the day in the first century. Um, they're very different. In fact, Koine Greek, for a long, long time, the only examples of Koine Greek we had were the documents, the Greek documents of the New Testament. And early scholars used to refer to Koine Greek, which is common Greek. As, as Holy Ghost Greek, because they thought the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, had created a special version of Greek in order to give the New Testament. Well, later on, with scholarship and archaeology, they started finding more and more examples of this Koine Greek, which was everyday kind of thing. But Koine Greek, the reason it was so thought to be so special is it's really different than either formal, that is Attic Greek, you know, the... the uh, the formal Greek that we read in the Greek uh, playwrights and scholars and all that from ancient times, and it's different than modern Greek. So there are some languages where the difference between ancient and modern is very great. Hebrew, in my, in my understanding of it, he, ancient Hebrew and modern Hebrew are not that different, except there's some ancient Hebrew that went out of use and we don't know what it means anymore. Some, not a lot, but some. And then there's a lot of Hebrew that's had to be invented because refers to things that didn't exist. I mean, Hebrew words for computer and printer and modem and uh, whatever else, obviously. Uh, but there's not a huge difference between the two. If you study ancient Hebrew, you should do pretty well with modern Hebrew, in other words. If you study Koine Greek, it's like a different language to then start, try to study classical Greek, or modern Greek for that matter. I mean, I, I had... Uh, Biblical Greek, and even though I'd forgotten most of it, we're in Greece, and I can pick out the letters and stuff, but it's so different than what I was used to. Did you have something, Chris? Yeah. The Talmud, does that only deal with the Torah, or does it deal with some of the other books, like it, the commentary? It's more than that. Uh, it's more than just just the, the Torah. It, it deals with every aspect of life. And I'm going to get to that. I'm going to give you some examples of that, so a good question. But the Torah, the importance of the Torah to the Jew is 
that it proved to be critical for the Jewish people because they've gone through so many periods of time, starting with like the Babylonian exile, where they were in exile. They were away from their homes, they were away from the temple, they were away from you know, Jerusalem, and the records were destroyed, everything else. The study of the Torah became the focal point for Jewish culture. It became the linchpin that held everything together. And at this point, I want to say that uh, earlier I mentioned when we say Torah, we usually, uh, the translation for that is usually law. That's a completely wrong conception from anything we understand as law. We think that laws are rules, and if you break them, you get busted, right? They're, they're a, a legal set of requirements. There's, that's only one sort of uh, partial aspect to what the Torah was. Yes, some of them are rules. You broke the rules, and back in the day when there was a Sanhedrin or a, a Jewish court, you could be uh, judged for that and punished for that. But a much better word for Torah is instruction. Because to the Jew, the Torah was God's own revelation of himself to the Jewish people in a very special way. The Torah was actually God, God telling the Jewish people what he was like and what he wanted. To look, at, to, to look at and immerse yourself and study the Torah for, a, for an Old Testament Jew was like looking at the face of God. There was much less a sense that this is, these are rules I have to follow or I'm going to get in trouble, and much more a sense that God himself has revealed himself to us and has shown how much he loves us and how special we are to him by giving us this set of instruction. So it's a, we have a completely wrong idea when we talk about the Torah or the Old Testament covenant as being the law, we interpret it like the laws that are passed down by the Supreme Court. That's not what it was. This was the promise. This was the, the re revelation. This was the commitment, uh, the covenant commitment that God had made to the Jewish people. It represented their relationship with God himself. And so it was a much different thing. Um, when, you, when you get into um, even modern day Orthodox Jews, when they talk about their love of the Torah, it's not because they're loving these rules. You know, even David talked about loving the law of the Lord. Well, it's not because he loved to study a bunch of rules that he had to follow. It's because that was God showing himself to us in terms of explaining his desires and his will and his relationship with us. Does that make sense to you? So that's why we talk about a theology of the law. It'd be a pretty short conversation if it just, okay, here's 613 rules and they had to obey them. Any questions? You know, it was a much deeper kind of thing than that. That was part of the of the Mosaic Law. Um, Excuse me. Was it was it during the exile that that uh, they started synagogues? And I, I mean, I guess maybe they started the practice of reading the law in, in a community while they were in exile. Well, the the reading of the reading of the Law and the Prophets uh, occurred in the temple. In fact, yeah. one of the early um, Talmudic demands, because again, the oral Talmud, the, the, one of the mishpat, was that the part of the Torah, and possibly other, but part of the Torah had to be read at least three times a week, publicly. There had to be a public reading at least three times a week. So that began even in the temple days. It especially was carried on, again, during the time of exile, the Torah became even more important to the Jewish people. And the, the idea of synagogue, if you all, the question John has asked, do you all understand what synagogues were? All of Jewish worship was oriented around the temple in Jerusalem. That was the heart and center of the whole Jewish faith. Everything in terms of their, um, their worship and sacrifice, their, their coming before God, that was where God lived, as far as they were concerned. So when the temple was destroyed and they were exiled out of Jerusalem, rather than just give up on God, they began to have the synagogue as a focal point of worship. It wasn't seen as the temple. They didn't do animal sacrifice there, but it was a place where if you had at least 10 male Jews, they could gather for prayer and for the reading of uh, scripture, Torah, prophets, wisdom, um, and that became the place of worship, and it became the community center. Again, because Torah became the center point of the whole Jewish culture during the time of exile, the synagogue was the place where you publicly read the Torah, so the synagogue became the center of Jewish life. And it was during exile that the synagogue was created. That was where it was invented because they didn't have the temple to go to. 
Yes, Ross. So they haven't been able to do any of the sacrifices since the temple was destroyed. No. That's why they're so focused on rebuilding the temple, so they can continue with God's will for sacrifice. Many, in fact, I would say most of the, of the Jews of the world have either become so secular they don't think about that anymore, or many of them have subverted the, the whole sacrificial system to a Zionistic expectation. And we talked about that before. Instead of the practice of the faith through animal sacrifice and the various other laws, in fact, fewer than half of the mitzvot, the, the commandments of the Old Testament, can be practiced now because of the lack of the temple and whatnot. And I'll give you those numbers in a minute. But they stopped focusing on either the practice of the faith through the sacrificial processes, they stopped focusing on the Messiah, which was this, one of the other big parts of the Jewish expectation, and they started focusing almost entirely on the Zionistic expectation, which is the land. And so from the 1940s on especially, that's been the orientation because that's the one part of it they do have. They can't rebuild the temple in Jerusalem because you know, there are two Islamic mosques on the Temple Mount. You know, talk about a war real quick, you start trying to do something about that. And um, the expectation of the Messiah, most of them have just sort of forgotten that in favor of this Zionistic expectation. There are Jews today uh, Hasidim and Orthodox Jews, who uh, I have read, are preparing all of the implements and everything necessary that when they believe that, that God will somehow miraculously destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, the temple will be rebuilt and they will reinstitute animal sacrifice. And so they're preparing all the stuff they need to get going with that. But they can't do anything until God, they believe, will miraculously eventually intervene. Okay? Yes, Chris? If they can't, or they obviously don't do the sacrifice, then do they have a means of forgiveness of sin since the sacrifice was the means of forgiveness of sin? They, they now believe that a righteous life fulfills that same expectation. Not perfectly, but because they say, well, it's in God's will that, that we're not, we don't have a temple anymore, then it must be okay with him for now that we simply... I'm going to talk about sin, their concept of sin, and, and the eschatological, or the end times kind of expectation. Their belief is that there is always a root, uh, people are not condemned for sin, because it's inevitable that they sin, and that God always gives them a road to return. You know, the Hebrew word for, for repent literally means return. It's very similar to metanoia in Greek, which means turn around and go the other way. So to a Jew, there, God always gives a road to return from sin. And so... Um, Asking for forgiveness, repenting from your sin, and doing righteous deeds is what is sufficient to save you in the absence of the ability to make uh, sacrificial, uh, sacrificial atonement for sins. But didn't you say that the Jews don't, don't have the same conception of salvation, that to them salvation is return, was redemption to the promised land, that they were right. only redeemed to the promised land. So what do the Jews actually consider is salvation? Well, they don't have a concept of salvation the same way. Salvation to them would mean return from exile. And I'm going to get into the details of their eschatological beliefs. You know, what, what in other words, what do they think is going, to, is going to happen? And you might be quite astonished when you actually look at the list of how similar it sounds to the Jewish expectation, or to the Christian expectation. Um, they don't believe it's a spiritual thing. They don't believe somebody gets spiritually <coughs> saved. They believe that, um, that it's something that is manifest in their life and that God is going to do something miraculous in this life. That the new heaven and the new earth, which they also believe in, is going to be a very nitty-gritty, matter-of-fact kind of stuff. The Jews have always believed that if someone is in God's favor, then they will experience um, blessing in their life. That's, I mentioned this, I think, in the other class, that when, when you get the rich young ruler, which we read as the gospel reading this last weekend, or, uh, yeah, last Sunday, um, and Jesus tells the rich young ruler, obey all the commandments, and he says, I've done this my whole life, and he goes, and, and Jesus looked at him and loved him. We always leave that part off, and I think that's critical. Jesus looked at him and loved him, and said, well, go and sell all that you have, and give your goods to the poor, and come and follow me. And the man went away very sad, because he was of great wealth, okay? Um, and Jesus says how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he again comes back and says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go and get into the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples go, what? Well, if that's true, how does anybody get saved? Because their thought, the Jewish thought, which is still true today for Orthodox Jews, 
is that the sign of God's blessing is material well-being in this life. If you're rich, if you have a lot of stuff, if you're healthy, then God has blessed you. You are in God's favor. If you are sick, like in the, in the, in the New Testament stories, the lepers, those who were born lame, the man who's born blind, they say, was it him or his parents who sinned? Because if somebody is bad off, then it must be that they did something against God, because that's a sign of God's uh, not favoring you versus wealth and health being a sign of God's favor. That same kind of idea, that your physical well-being is a sign of God's favor or his disfavor, carries through to the Jewish eschatological expectations even today. Okay? All right. Let me keep going with this. Um, there are actually, when we talk about the law, there are six different and complementary versions of the law, if you will, in the Torah, in the, the first five books of the Bible. Here I'm talking about the written Torah. The first one is called the Ethical Dialogue. And you know it better as the Ten Commandments, or Decalogue, Dialogue. The eth Ethical Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Decalogue is sometimes with a capital D, the word that's used in scholarly writings to talk about the Ten Commandments, you know, the Ten Words, literally. Because in Hebrew, it's not actually Ten Commandments. If you translate it, it's the Ten Words. Um, so the Ten Commandments found in Exodus 20, the first 17 uh, verses, is a list of the primary, that is, of first order, religious and moral imperatives that are given by God through Moses to the Israelites. So that's the high point. That's the, that's the purest and simplest version of the most important pieces of the law. And we're going to come back to that a little bit. The second... Oh, I didn't even put that one up there. I'm reading, I'm talking about it, you can't see it. So the ethical decalogue. The second, which comes right after that, is called the covenant code. Um, it's an expansion of the Mosaic law beyond the Ten Commandments. If you read the Ten Commandments, which goes through the 17th verse of chapter 20 of, of Exodus, and then you keep reading, you have three more chapters of all kinds of other rules about what you can do and can't do and what's, you know, what's clean and unclean and all that. That's called the Covenant Code. The Ten Commandments was not the sum of the law. That was just sort of the high point. You know, that was the icing on the cake. When you get into the cake, there are various other levels of it. The Covenant Code being the next level. Then you have what's called the Ritual Decalogue. This is from Exodus 34, 11, and 26. It's a legal summary that's similar to the Covenant Code. It's almost like you've got the Ten, ten Commandments, then you've got three chapters full of instructions in, in, of what you should and shouldn't do. Then the ritual decalogue in Exodus 34 kind of comes back and does a real short 10-point retelling of what the Covenant Code was about. Kind of a mini Ten Commandments that reflect more than the stuff that's in the Covenant Code. Then you get the Priestly Code. This is the whole book of Leviticus and part of the book of Numbers. They're the regulations that are related to ritual, to the temple worship, to the Jewish priesthood. Um, how, the, how the priests are supposed to dress, how they're supposed to be ordered in terms of who serves when, um, how they ritually clean themselves, uh, etc., etc. All of the stuff about the temple worship, and that gets into sacrifice. All of the instructions about the different kinds of sacrifice. You know, there's, there's sacrifice, um, sin sacrifices, and, and uh, thanksgiving, and oh, praise, wave offering sacrifices, and all kinds of stuff. That all comes into the priestly code. Then, as a subset in there, the, what's called the Holiness Code, Leviticus 17 to 26, it's not distinct in terms of content, it's part of the Priestly Code, but it's identified often, you'll, you'll see a reference to the Holiness Code, because these nine chapters talk about, um, let's see, the nine or ten, um, talk about the holiness issues. The word holy appears over and over and over again. It talks about the things that are holy and the things that are not holy. And so often that's called the Holiness Code. And then finally, the sixth version of a legal code we have is the Deuteronomic Code, which is the whole book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy contains about one-third of the total mitzvot. Again, remember the word mitzvot is Hebrew for commandments. Uh, uh, the, the commandments in the Torah, and therefore that's a major part of the Jewish law. These six sections, and the Holiness Code is a subset of the Priestly Code, but these six presentations are all various versions of um, the law codes that are found in the Torah. Now you add them all up to get the total picture, and there is some repetition in them. But uh, altogether, they give all of the commandments that the Jewish 
the, all of the written commandments as part of the written Torah that the Jews felt God had given them through Moses um, at Mount Sinai. All right, now let's talk about a little more, a little more detail. Oh, that's interesting. Pay no attention to the things at the bottom here. I don't know if that was set up or not. Well, I'm going to go ahead and put it all up. The Torah is understood by rabbinical tradition to contain 613 distinct mitzvot. A mitzvah is a commandment, a singular mitzvah. Okay? The bar mitzvah, you've heard of a bar mitzvah? Okay, this is a commandment regarding the son. Bat mitzvah is a commandment regarding the daughter. That's when a bar mitzvah is when a, when a son does his first public reading of Torah in front of, in front of the members of the congregation. And officially that day becomes a man. It has to take on, in terms of the religious community, has to take on responsibilities as a man. Usually happens around age 13. So, but mitzvah is the singular for commandment. So it is a command regarding sons that they go through this process. Bat mitzvah, a command regarding daughters. The, the mitzvot are the moral directives from God or moral deeds which much, must be fulfilled. Sometimes they'll use mitzvah or mitzvot as a sort of generic reference to doing a good thing. But literally it means the six, one of the 613 uh, commandments that are in the Torah. Now six of the mitzvot are called the constant mitzvot. They are the, considered especially important and, and completely binding at all times. There is no way you can get away from these six. They are supposed to be present and, and you're supposed to be aware of them all the time in your life. The first one is to believe God and to believe that He created all things. The second is not to believe in anything else but God. If, you, if this sounds familiar, this is sort of a, a restating of uh, those first two, of the first two commandments. You know, um, you'll have no other God before me. Uh, in fact, you can't have any other idols uh, of anything on earth or in heaven or under the sea, and you can't worship them. The third of the constant mitzvah is to believe in God's oneness. This one particularly <laughs> was an important one for the Jews with regard to the response to, to Christianity. Because Christianity said there were three persons in one God. Well, the Shema from Deuteronomy says, uh, Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Uh, and then, you know, Jesus, that's what Jesus is referring to later. So, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, became a major focus for them, and that was, that's the biggest argument they've always had against Christianity. Christianity seems to be saying there are three gods. We're not really, but the subtlety of that escapes them, okay? The fourth is to fear God. In this case, uh, this question always comes up, there's, there really are two different definitions of fear. The one that we think of as fear is to be, um, to be dismayed because of a danger. That's a good definition. Just to experience dismay because of a danger. Well, that's not the fear of God. The, but the fear of God is recognizing in awe that He is God and you are not. That He truly is the maker, the, the creator, the power in the universe. That He can do whatever He wishes. You know, it's, it's not, some people say awe, it's like, oh wow, cool, God. No, that's not what fear of the Lord means. You know, it's not what fear of God means. It means recognition of His awesomeness in a way that really should make us a little scared. Okay. Then, to love God is number five, and number six, not to pursue the passions of your heart or stray after your eyes. Now, if you recognize, if you take those six things and recognize that those are the constant in its fault and we're supposed to, those things are supposed to be present all the time, uh, it doesn't leave a whole lot of room for other stuff. <laughs> you know, especially number six is kind of a catch-all in terms of don't do the things that your heart and your eyes are trying to get you to do that you know aren't right. Okay. Questions about that? Let's talk a little bit more about the um, 613 mitzvot. And by the way, there are the, the 613, there have been a number of different rabbis down through the ages who have outlined this 613. There have been some rabbis and some today who disagree with that number. They think, no, there's not 613, it needs to be broken up differently. But that's, gen that's generally accepted. Um, in fact, uh, Maimonides, who I quoted last week, I think, was it in this class I quoted Maimonides? <coughs> Rambam? 
Um, he, he had the 13 principles of the Jewish faith. Um, I think I did that under covenant. Um, anyway, he was one of the great rabbis of all time. He's one of the early ones, not the first, but one of the early ones who identified 613 distinct different commandments or mitzvah in the Torah. Um, so what happens is you have, uh, in addition to the 613 biblical commandments, that is the written Torah, there are seven rabbinical mitzvot, meaning these are things the rabbis say uh, should be done by a righteous Jew. The first one is that they should recite a blessing for each enjoyment. Anytime you have anything that is a good thing, you should recite a blessing for it. Secondly, you should ritually wash your hands before eating a meal with bread. The idea being if you're touching the food, which you touch bread with your hands, then to make sure that you're not being unclean, you need to ritually wash your hands. Third, to prepare lights in advance of Shabbat. In other words, to get everything ready before the Sabbath so that you don't have to do any work during the Sabbath. The fourth one, and this is interesting because Carol and I just watched a TV show about this. Um, to construct an Eruv to permit carrying on the, the Shabbat. The Talmud, early Talmud, says that part of not doing any work on the Sabbath, Shabbat, means you can't carry anything. In fact, they give a, an Old Testament distance, which is less than two meters. That's how far you were allowed to move something before you were actually working. And when it says you're not allowed to carry anything, that includes not being allowed to carry any keys or tissues or a person who had needed a walking stick. They're not allowed to carry a walking stick. With the exception that you were allowed to do so within the courtyard of your home, according to the Talmud. So an Eruv, to construct an Eruv, they have, even today, in Hasidic Orthodox Jewish communities, and this was what Carolyn and I saw on a TV show, they have what's called an Eruv wire, and they will stretch a wire that goes along the sidewalk outside the Jewish homes in this community, which creates a courtyard, sort of an artificial courtyard. And they, they still don't try to abuse that, but for instance, the strict laws of, of the Torah and of the Talmud say a, a woman's not allowed to carry her baby more than five feet. Okay, well, that's not very practical when it comes to babies. So they create the Eruv Wire, and the show we saw was actually a, a three seasons ago, because we're catching up, an episode of The Good Wife, Lawyer Show, and this Orthodox Jewish couple was being sued because the Eruv Wire outside their house had fallen, supposedly, and a woman tripped over and sued them. Okay, remember that one? That's an Eruv Wire. Well, the construction of the Eruv Wire was so to permit them to be able to carry things, still a limited distance, it's still only as far as that wire reaches, but it means you could go from one room to the next carrying your baby, or you could go from one house to the next with a walking stick if you needed one, that kind of thing, because it was considered to be part of the courtyard. Isn't this interesting stuff? <laughs> and you had no idea when you watched that episode of The Good Wife, that's what they were talking about, right? Um, okay, to recite the Halal Psalms on holy days, we just talked about that in the, the Halal is a section of the Psalms. Halal is where we get the word hallelujah, it means praise. The Halal Psalms, or psalms of, particularly Psalms of Praise, that were to be recited on certain holy days, to light the Hanukkah, the Hanukkah lights, Hanukkah lights, to light the Hanukkah lights, which are the lights that represent the, the reestablishing, the cleansing and reestablishing of the temple um, under the Hasmonean dynasty in the intertestamental period, that's what Hanukkah is all about, that the miracle was that they did not have enough oil for the, light, the, the lights to last for the whole eight days, which was supposed to be the celebration. And so they lit them anyway, and they prayed to God, and God miraculously made the lights uh, continue to burn, even beyond what the oil should have lasted for the whole eight days. That's the eight days of Hanukkah, and that's the Hanukkah lights. And then to read the scroll of Esther on Purim. Uh, Purim is the celebration of the story of Esther when the Jews were saved from destruction by Haman. You got Some of you were in the class on, on uh, Monday. If you don't know the story in the book of Esther, you really need to study that because it is a, one of the greatest stories ever. And it's just fun. It's very cool. And the bad guy gets his comeuppance at the end. So those were the seven rabbinical, that is, that is established by the rabbis, that were added to the 613 biblical commandments and to make 620 total. Um, I should, should I'll, I'll tell you at this point, I'll get into this a little bit, uh, some other things later. The Hebrew people, we've talked about that um, 
several of the classes. They're very poetic. This, there's a lot of um, rhythm and meter and, that, and rhyme in Hebrew writing. Um, if you look at, at Psalm 119 in your Bibles, you'll see that the first section has, a, has Aleph above it, and there's a Hebrew character. Aleph is the first letter in the Hebrew uh, alphabet. The second section uh, has Beit in the Hebrew character, Dalet, Gimel, and on. All, the 119 psalm, the longest psalm in the Bible, is broken up, and each section is headed by a letter of the alphabet. Well, the Hebrew, they've got this, this very complex kind of relationship between letters and numbers and words and rhythms and rhyme. And, in fact, there's, there's a whole study called the, the gematria, which, I, which assigns, sort of like numerology, let's face it, it assigns numerical values to every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So, because of that, every word has a numerical value, right? The, um, the first nine letters of the Hebrew alphabet are numbered one through nine. The, the next, the next um, ones are numbered for the tens, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, so the next nine. Then the next four are for the hundreds, because there's 24, uh, I guess 20, 23 letters in the, in the Hebrew alphabet. It's 100, 200, 300, 400. And so every word, if you add up the numerical value of the letters, it gives it a numerical value. There is a sort of, there's two levels of focus on that. One is just sort of the reveal, which is kind of, isn't it cool sort of thing. Not a huge deal done with it. The other is really mystical. You've heard of the Kabbalah? You know, the, the yellow string that Madonna wears around her wrist, which says that she's a follower of Kabbalah. This is this really kind of strange mystical Judaism, which really gets into the numerology and really uses it, believing that you can tell the future and all kinds of stuff with it. Um, and that's based upon these numerical and, and alphabetic relationship and values. Well. When we talk about 613 and 620, and you go, why does it matter how many there are? Why is that such a big deal? Well, to them it is. The word Torah, it, the numerical value of the word Torah is 600. Um, and you then, if I can remember all of this, um, let me see. If you then take the, uh, well, I'll get to that. I'll remember particulars of in a minute. Anyway, the 613 means something to them in terms of how they get to that. Not just the fact they counted that many, but they think there's a numerical importance to it. And for the Jews, you get the idea that they've studied this thing to death, okay, that they've really twisted the, this thing in every direction possible, and it's true. Why? Because this was the thing that held them together as a people. Alright? This was, this was everything to them when they had nothing else. So, 620 total biblical commandments or mitzvot. Those 620 are broken into three categories. The first category is called the mishpatim. They are the commandments that seem self-evident, like don't kill people, don't steal stuff, don't commit adultery. To the Jewish mind, those are pretty obvious. And we know inherently that those things are wrong. So the self-evident commandments are the mishpatim. Then you have the adult which are testimonies that bear witness to the acts or character of God. Commandments about things like the Passover, um, the, you know, the, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, have to do with the fact that God in his character and love committed an act of salvation for the Jewish people. Um, don't, you know, don't have yeast around during the Passover season. Well, there's a reason for that. This is what yeast represents. So those kind of commandments are seen as representing either an act of God or some aspect of the character of God that they can clearly identify. And then they have uh, a category called shulim, which simply are manifestations of God's will, <laughs> which is a catch-all. It basically means we don't really understand, they don't seem self-evident, we don't really see how they fit into either acts or the nature of God, but he said to do them, so obviously they are manifestations of his will. Okay? Those are the three big categories that the 620 mitzvah are broken into. Now, I'm giving you a lot of this detail because I do want you to have a sense of what the law means, or at least meant, much more so, to the Jewish people. Um, of the 613 biblical mitzvah, 365 of them are negative, requiring abstinence from certain things. The big ones are 
don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, you know, don't, um, you know, don't covet, don't lie about your neighbor kind of stuff. These are seen against, this goes back to this numerical thing, because there are 365 of those, the Jews associate those as coinciding with the total number of days in a solar year. And you go, well, what's the big deal about that? It's because they've studied this stuff for so long, they look to find associations between nature and, and you know, the reality as we experience it and the particular divine revelation that is the Torah. The second uh, big category here, there are 613, of the 613 biblical spot, 248 of them are positive, things you should do. They see that number as coinciding with the number of bones and major organs in the human body. I, I looked up the number of bones and organs in the human body. I don't quite see where they get that, but that's what they get, what they said. All right, and as I said earlier, many of the mitzvot cannot be performed now. That should be mitzvot. That's a singular. Uh, cannot be performed now due to the destruction of the temple, the fact that there is no longer a temple. In fact. Of the 360, of the 613 mitzvot, 77 of the positive ones and 194 of the negative ones can be observed today. So less than half. 26 can only be applied if you're inside the nation of Israel, because they have to do with something having to do with the nation of Israel, being in country. Some of the mitzvah apply only to certain types of people, that is the priests. There are some of the mitzvot that relate to the priesthood, some relate to kings responsibilities of kings. Some of them apply only to men, some of them apply only to women. Okay, um, so they're very particular in that regard. It's also, back to that um, question, is there, that was just clearing in the throat, okay. Um, you all are familiar with the prayer shawls that Jewish men will wear, you know, in time of prayer, you've, you've seen TV shows. The uh, the knotted fringes at the bottom of the prayer shawls are called uh, tzizit. The prayer shawls themselves are called talit. <coughs> the prayer shawl and the knots on the, in the fringes are symbols of the mitzvah. They're symbols of the commandments that are in the Torah. In fact, the idea is that whenever a, uh, a Jewish man uses a prayer shawl and he sees these fringes, He's supposed to be reminded of all of the different Torah commandments. So the fringes and the knots in the fringes are significant in terms of their symbolism for a Jewish Jewish person. Um, and I, I mentioned to you about the the 613 being important. 600 is the number of the the word of the Torah, and then 13. If you take the uh, the twisted fibers of the uh, tzitzit and fold them over and you count them on one side, it's supposed to be 13, and that's where they get 613, too. Just as an affirmation, okay? I'm not advocating this, I'm just telling you that's the way that, how, how very in detail they are in this stuff. Um, of the 613 mitzvot, 611 of them were seen as being given to Moses. That's in the written Torah. But they believe that God gave two earlier commandments. First to Adam and Eve, and then it was restated to Noah, and that was be fruitful and multiply. And to Abraham, the commandment to circumcision, which was really the only rule that, you know, the only thing that, that uh, Abraham was given is your, your, your male should be circumcised. So those two, plus 611 that are written in the, the Torah of Moses, make the 613. And as I said before, there's some disagreement about whether 613 is the actual number, but traditionally it's still viewed as that. In fact, sometimes they will, they will refer to, instead of saying the law, or the Mosaic law, or the Torah, they will call it the 613 commandments, or the 613 mitzvah. Um, now, let's get a little bit more into uh, the, what does all that mean? <laughs> the 613 mitzvah, Combined with later Talmudic and Rabbinic law, and I'm going to talk about the Talmud in, in, after a break, they form what's called the Halakha. The Halakha is the collective body of religious and social laws for Jews. Now remember, Halak, the, uh, the Jewish people were, uh, lived in a theocracy, meaning the government, the political government, and the religious government were one. All right? It was a theocracy. 
So when we say the halakha, the collective body of laws and rules, those were laws not only for religious practice, but also for you know, the court system. The halakha in Hebrew literally means to walk or to go. So the halakha, the, the bulk, the whole total of the Jewish law together. Um, and again, it's not just the Torah. Some of these are rules that people made up, the rabbis made up over the years in terms of how to... How to how 613 to, of them. What's that? 613. Well, more than that. It's, there's more than 613. Uh, the 613 are the written biblical ones, are the biblical mitzvah. You then get later Talmudic and Rabbinic additions to that. So there's a lot more than 613 in the uh, rules or commandments in the total halakha. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Because it involves not just the religious observance, which is, is the, the, you know, the written, the, the Torah is about religious observance, even when it tells you how to conduct yourself. It's because God said to. Whereas some of the later stuff, the Rabbinic and Talmudic additions, had to do with property rights and you know, things like that which were more social laws, but together all of those rules and laws make up what's called the halakha. Okay? Um, we're going to talk when we come back, I'm going to take a break here, we're going to talk about the Jewish idea of sin, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the Talmud and how all of this affects our understanding as Christians of the law today. You may address this in the next one, but my question is, is this what Paul rose against when he talked about men being justified, attempting to be justified by the law? Is this what he was what he, what he was considering? Is this what he ranted against? You know, uh, my question is: Is there a? Um, uh, I, I know that there's been rabbinic uh, additions to this right. that are contemporary. These right. are contemporary rules that are placed on this. So that's not during a period of time of Paul. But in the biblical... Um... Most of this was before Paul. I mean, the rabbinic, the real additions to it went up to the 500s. So but this is what he's, he's, he's challenging. That, to... but let, me, let me clarify that. Paul uh, confronted and challenged and disagreed with the fact that people thought they were made righteous by following all these minimum, minimum right. little details. And again, the, the, the Jews, to be quite honest, had obsessed about this stuff to an insane degree. You can see why. Exactly. Because this was all they had. All right? Now, Paul is in the time after the return from the Babylonian exile, when the new temple had been built and everything. But see, much of the stuff de developed, especially during the, after 500 BC, uh, 586 BC was the exile in Babylon. So much of this stuff really got obsessed about and focused on and written down and everything during the exile. The fact is that the written Torah was God's, God did communicate that. That was important to God. That really was God revealing his will in himself. Paul did not have trouble, I don't think, with the Jews following that. What he had a problem with is they got so obsessed about other little details, rabbinic details. They got so obsessed with trying to find loopholes, okay, he said, you know, Jesus at one point says, uh, you give a tenth of your mint and a tenth of your spice, but you don't give a tenth of your money. You've got excuses for not doing that, okay? You claim it's korban, that it is committed to God, and you won't even care for your parents because you claim the money you should spend to take care of them, you committed it to God, okay? So both Jesus and Paul were not saying that the written, particularly the, the biblical Torah, the rules, the, the 613 that are in the written scripture, they were not saying those are wrong or those are bad. God gave them, gave that to the Jews. It's what the Jews did with them. They completely forgot about the fact that the focus was supposed to be, this reflects God. Change. My obedience to this is how I should serve God. Instead, they were trying to be righteous and cool by seeing how well they could follow the rules and being critical of people who didn't follow the rules so much. Sound familiar? You know? I can't imagine how many times I've heard somebody in the South, being from the South, say, well, you know, they, they, they're there every time the door opens in the church, but I know I'm as good as they are because they did this and they did that. And they did you know, that whole righteousness by, um, by action, completely forgetting what the heart was. There was a substitution. They allowed exactly. the system to substitute. They turned it into, into something to make themselves feel better or feel righteous instead of saying, this is of God. You know, what does God want us to do with this? So yes, that's what Paul had trouble with. In effect, when Jesus said, you follow the, the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law, 
That's exactly what he meant. You've forgotten why. You've forgotten who this came from. You've forgotten what it represents. And in fact, you're so concerned about every little jot and tittle. Well, you, you can see why they were absorbed in this. Oh, yeah. They were just fascinated by it. And so they get, That's and human they get nature. captured, captured we, by it. Yeah. My point is, a minute ago, a second ago, is we do the same thing. Yeah. Absolutely the same thing. It's human nature. Okay, we're going to take a break. Uh, let's come back together at 10 after. I've got two minutes after right now, so about eight minutes. Would you turn off the camera, please? Okay, let's talk about the Jewish conception, and we're talking about the, the Old Testament Jewish conception under the Old Covenant Law, or the Mosaic Law. Judaism regards sin, and has always regarded sin, as anything that was a violation of the mitzvah of the law. Here they have 613. Uh, different commandments or laws, rules, 620 if you include the rabbinic, um, and then there's also the lesser level of authority of uh, some of the other Talmudic and rabbinic writings. But any a sin was any violation of that, pretty cut and dry. Right? And that's why there are so many of them, it's because they cover pretty much every situation. The generic word in Hebrew for sin is avera, which means transgression, to transgress, to step across. One, one of the rules or directions you're given, either to not do things or to do things. To the Jews, um, the Old Testament, there were three levels of sin. <clears throat> the first one was called Pesha, which is an intentional sin. That's to intentionally or deliberately commit an act in defiance of God. That's the worst kind. Um, then the second level was Avon, which is a sin of lust or uncontrollable emotion. Um, a sin of passion, if you will. You know, we have those kind of categories. Somebody who who commits an act of violence because of the passion of the moment. Uh, this is that, what that's talking about. Something that is not consistent with one's true inner desires, but it still is done knowingly, but not in defiance to God. It's not done with forethought, in other words. The difference between these two is premeditation or spur of the moment. And the third kind is an unintentional sin or chet. It's possible to commit a sin against God without intending to, if you still violate one of the regulations, one of the rules. So in that regard, there is more of a focus on the letter of the law rather than the spirit. You could intend well, but still violate one of the mitzvot, one of the commandments, and that is considered a sin. Now, it's interesting, they have a lot of other ways that they break things up in terms of in the halakha, the total religious and social law structure that they had, they actually broke it down into um, various kinds that, that call for degrees of punishment. And again, we have the same thing in our legal system when you talk about premeditated murder versus second degree murder versus manslaughter kind of thing. So all of the various kinds of, in the halakha, the larger uh, body of, of law that was used for social and religious purposes, they have all those kinds of things too. Michael? But are these grades of sin actually from the Old Testament and the... Their interpretations of the Old Testament. Okay, so this is rabbinic. Um... This is based upon what they see when we say the 613 mitzvot. Those are the biblical regulations uh, or commandments. But then they decided there's, that in terms of how they're viewed, there are, there are three categories of them. Okay. Are, are these in... Uh, I they're think... not in script. This, this is not in scripture. This oh, is an interpretation. Okay. This is like an evolution, a modern, a modern evolution of what, what scripture... And right, and it's, okay. it's a theological interpretation, which, lest we jump on that too hard, let's remember that a lot of what our basic beliefs are are theological interpretations. Our belief in the Trinity is a belief that we draw as a theological interpretation from things that are specifically in Scripture. So the Jews would say that based upon what Scripture says about violations, it seems like there are different categories of them. I'm trying to relate this to the New Testament. And so, so this, you know, this is probably wasn't... Which is not necessarily a good thing to do when you're doing Old Testament theology at this point, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I would contest that. Well, I know, but we need to understand that God revealed himself in the Old Testament first. And so, and I started out the class saying that yes, and the last class is going to be talking about the transition from this in the New Testament, you know, in the New Testament. But that this was God's word too. This was God's revelation too. I'm not challenging that. Right. I'm not, don't misunderstand yeah. me. I'm not challenging that. I'm trying to see the relationship between what this is. This is more contemporary, I suppose. And, and so this was not an issue in the times of Paul when he was writing Romans and stuff like that. Uh, this is Talmudic. It would have probably been there by Paul's time because the writing, the most of the Talmudic stuff occurred um, 
Well, well, we'll get into some dates. You know, it may or may not have been. Could have been either way. But there was a lot of theological interpretation even by the time of Paul. So uh, now it's interesting though when you get into the sort of breaking down of categories of things. One other way that they divide uh, the misthought is the laws in relation, the laws in relationship to God, that are obediences to God, versus the laws that have to do with relationships with other people. This idea of love God, love your neighbor kind of thing. That's another way that they divide this up. And the interesting thing is, in the Talmud, it says when you're looking at uh, sins against God directly, or sins against your neighbor because God told you not to, the sins against your neighbor are usually worse. Because in terms of repenting of those, you have to not only apologize to God, you have to apologize to your neighbor too. <laughs> so it requires a higher degree, a, a more intentional kind of repentance than a sin against God, which is kind of an interesting way to look at it. But again, talking about sin, in Judaism, a state of sin does not condemn a person to some form of damnation. Because there's always seen as being a road to repentance. During the temple time, that was seen as the sacrificial system. After the destruction of the temple, when they were in exile, the, the Jewish interpretation of it was, well, you know, God put us here, God brought us here, we don't have the temple anymore, but he has not left us bereft of some way to be forgiven for the sins we commit, and everybody commits a sin. It is very, very rare, special saintly person in the Jewish idea that has not committed sins, which is consistent with our belief. But they believe that in every case, God gives away a, a road to repentance, or the teshuva, literally return, to turn around and come back, and that that is the way you deal with sin. If, you're not, if you don't have the temple, you can't sacrifice animals for the forgiveness of sins, then the responsibility is on the person who commits the sin to acknowledge it, to turn, stop doing the, the wrong act, make, you know, make a penance for it, and to, to live a more righteous life. Okay, now... In the days when Judaism um, had a functioning court system, such as the Sanhedrin that we read about in the Gospels. The Sanhedrin, you know, the Jesus was brought before, that was their high court. It was the high court both of the religious system and of the political system. Now, in the New Testament accounts, the Sanhedrin was limited in what they could do because the, the, ultimately they were responsible for the Romans, because the Romans were the military <coughs> rulers. But when the courts existed, the courts could administer physical punishments for violation of the law. You'll, we read in the New Testament about times when Jesus and Paul and others were flogged, they were beaten, sometimes they used exile. Um, there were different kinds of punishments that the Sanhedrin could do. And prior to the Romans coming in and running it, the Sanhedrin had the authority to, to uh, execute people for very severe punishments. Um, Blasphemy, adultery, there were several that were sufficient, they believed, to be uh, executable offenses. But the Romans wouldn't allow them to execute anybody. That's why the Sanhedrin had to keep going back to the Romans, going back to Pontius Pilate, saying, we think he should be crucified, because they didn't have permission to, commit, to execute anybody when the Romans were ruling them. Then when the temple was destroyed, um, Execution was forbidden because there, so much of the sacrificial system, so much of the worship system was gone away. They felt like making that level of judgment was not longer, no longer appropriate. But there were still Jewish communities that existed. First in exile, and then later even in Europe, there were distinct Jewish communities. But when the last of the autonomous Jewish communities in, in Europe fell, they fell apart, don't exist anymore, then other halakhic punishments, you know, which would have been flogging or uh, exile or various other kinds of things, they were taken away. There's no longer any court that has authority to assess punishment to a Jewish person for violation of any of the Torah or the halakhic laws. Okay? That no longer exists. So today, no single body has the authority to create universal precedents and say, this is what all Jews have to do. You know, there's not a sense in which they are a nation anymore in that regard. A Jewish accounts of sin and righteousness are seen as reckoned only by God. There is no longer an earthly authority, like there used to be in the Sanhedrin or in the Jewish community councils, where you were responsible to them to make, you know, if you violate something in the law. Now it is you and God. It's entirely up to you. Now, if you're part of a Jewish community, the rabbi might call you up short. But he can't punish you. He, there's no, there's no uh, uh, means by which you can be held uh, temporarily accountable for anything you've done wrong. That's between you and God. 
yeah, they may stop talking to you, but that's about the worst they can do, you know. Yes? Is that also true in Israel today? That there's no, even with the Hasidic Jews, that they, they don't? Well, that's true, but in Israel, they have the federal law now. I mean, Israel has their own laws, which are, which are a political legal system, court system and all of that, uh, which is influenced somewhat, uh, I wouldn't take that too far, but it's influenced by the biblical law, but is not, they don't get into the religious stuff. There are no, there are no political federal regulations that you observe the religious law. But they do have, you know, they have a court system like any other country now. But it's not, they don't, they don't mandate the religious aspects. They're probably a little more than we're used to, but not to the extent that certainly they used to in the Jewish system. Okay. So there's no Sanhedrin or no. Pharisees now? And there isn't. What, what, what caused them to, to, to do away with that? The destruction of the temple. Uh, all of that was based, that on, the was based on the temple. Yep, and that's why the, the hope and expectation of the temple is, is the most important for the Orthodox Jews, the Hasidim and, and other Orthodox bodies. That's the, the reestablishing of the temple is the most critical piece, um, getting back to where they think the Jews should be. Right, um, and then the Talmud says that even though Jewish courts can no longer punish for sin, because part of the Talmud was written after there were no longer any Jewish courts that penalties continue to be assessed by God. What they say basically is that perhaps accidents are not really accidents. If somebody commits a sin for the punishment for which would have been stoning, well, they might fall off the roof and onto a pile of stones and die, okay? That the Talmud suggests that God continues to assess punishments appropriately, but he does it directly rather than through some Jewish court. I've re referred the, to the Talmud several times. There are several um, bodies of literature that are collations or collections of material that have come from the rabbis down through the centuries that are different than the Torah, the Torah well, the, different than the written Torah, which is the, in the first five books of the Hebrew Bible of our Old Testament. The Talmud is actually the, the Talmud is defined as instruction or learning, which means it's very close to the word Torah, because Torah means law or instruction. Instruction is probably a better definition for it. Torah includes, when it says instruction, it suggests more a combination of what has been learned rather than the projecting of instruction, which is sort of what Torah means. The Talmud is the central text of, or a central text of rabbinical Judaism. It's considered second only to the written Torah, that is the five books of Moses in authority, it contains the opinions of literally thousands of rabbis on a variety of subjects, including law, ethics, philosophy, customs, history, theology, lore, you know, there are legends in there, um, and, and much more. It was written between 200, um, actually that should be 200 BC, and 500 AD. Um, it consists of 63 tractates, sort of like what we call a book. Right? A tractate is a section and over 6,200 pages long if it is printed out in normal type. Okay, it's a huge document. Can you imagine what it was like when this stuff was all on scrolls? Um, that, that like was, the NIV Bible. Yeah, that's quite something. <laughs> <laughs> so within the Talmud, there are two sections. Um, one is the Mishnah, and the other is the Gemara. The Mishnah was a collection of things. It was first written down in about 220 AD. This was the first fully written compendium of Jewish oral law. Um, and it attempted to capture the oral traditions all the way back to Pharisaic times. Now, when we say Pharisaic times, 536 would have been like 50 years after the fall of Jerusalem, after Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. They, got, they were in exile in Jerusalem, or in uh, Babylon. They began to sort of get settled back there, and then some of them began to return. And so they started the rebuilding of the temple, they started the reinstitution of the, of the, the uh, implementation of the temple law and regulations around that time, and that continued up until the time of Jesus. 70 AD was when the second temple was destroyed by the Romans. So then that whole period of time, in addition to the written Torah, the five books of the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament the first five books, you had all of these rabbis during that uh, 600 year period who were commenting on the law, on the Torah, who were applying it, who were uh, giving their philosophical assessments of it, who were capturing stories, 
Um, you know, that some of them are simply legends that are they're intended to prove a point. History, things that are happening, you know, et cetera, et cetera, a whole combination of stuff for like 600 years. And the, um, so the oral traditions of the Pharisaic times, and then also, and this, this, these two overlap, the uh, sayings of the Tanaim. Tanaim were Jewish rabbis that were 1st century B.C. to 2nd century A.D., so that overlaps the first section. Um, kind of a different approach, but all of those are wrapped into the Mishnah, and the purpose very simply was that they felt like they had moved away from the oral tradition so much that they didn't start writing this stuff down, they were going to forget it. And so, again, starting 220 AD, they started writing down stuff, some of which had been was 700 years old, that they wanted to capture in writing, and they continued to do that for a period of time. That's the, the Mishnah is the first half, that's the oldest part. The second half is the Gemara, which was written actually around 500 AD, and it, it's an elucidation, it's commentary on the Mishnah and other related uh, Tanaic writings, that is from these, these uh, Tanaean Jewish rabbis. So it's commentary, it's explanation, it's going deeper into it. You know, there's layers upon layers upon layers of discussion. It's sort of like a thread, you know, if you go online and you follow a thread post, some of it, that's what you're talking about here. You know, a rabbi made a comment, well, another rabbi commented on that, and somebody else commented on that, and on and on for several hundred years. So you can get an idea how much complexity there can be involved in all of this stuff. But these, the Mishnah and the Gemara together form the Talmud. Now I'll warn you, sometimes they will use the word Gemara as synonymous with Talmud, although it's, one, it's only part of it. In fact, it's the lesser part of it. The Mishnah is bigger. Um, so the, the Talmud is second to the Torah. It is the capturing of all the rabbinic stuff. It is the oral Torah, which since has been written down. Okay. Questions about that? Another word that you will hear uh, from time to time is um, uh, um, I'll probably go with some of this stuff. The main tenets of Jewish eschatology. Let's talk about that. Based upon the writing of the prophets, especially the major prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, there, there is a clear sense in there, and some in Daniel as well, that the Jews are expecting um, a particular series of events at the end times. It's very interesting that the Jewish people, Christian people, and Islamic people all have expectations for end times. Eschatology means the end of things. First, uh, the Jewish people believe that at the end, God will bring, out, will bring forth a new exodus, a new bringing of the Jewish people out of exile, he will redeem the Jewish people from the exile that began with the Babylonian captivity. Now, in 586, when the temple and the, and the city of Jerusalem were destroyed, and the Jews went into exile in, in Babylon, when they started coming back, just 50, 50 or so years later, um, when Persia conquered Babylon, and then King Cyrus allowed the Jews to start coming back, and by the way, Cyrus did that for a lot of people. He was the first, like empire ruler who actually was allowing other religions to practice their faith and when cases where they've been suppressed he was encouraging them to start up again because he thought that was a good way to keep everybody happy you know so they would rebel so the jews he said you can go back and only a very few went back most of them either stayed in babylon or once they were given freedom to move where they wanted to they spread out in other places this is this is one of the great diasporas you'll see the word diaspora d-i-a-s-p-o-r-a which means the spreading out Christianity had a diaspora too after the stoning of Stephen and the persecution that was occurring uh, in, the, you know, in the New Testament, the book of Acts, the, Jew, the Christians spread out. All right? They left Jerusalem, they went to other places. This is one of the ways in which God uh, allowed for the message to be spread to new people. So most of the Jews who had been taken into exile in Babylon did not come back to Jerusalem. They either stayed in Babylon or they went somewhere else, which again is uniquely kind of uh, we see in hindsight God's hand in that because in Babylon there ended up being a significant body of Jewish scholars who later on were very significant in terms of contributing to the Talmud and contributing to Jewish scholarship and Jewish understanding. Um, there was a, a whole school, you know, we talked about Masoretic, uh, the Masoretic text, the official authorized Jewish text. There were a school of uh, scholars, Masoretic scholars, that were working in Jerusalem, but the ones that were working in Babylon were considered more significant. You know, they were more scholarly. Uh, 
And so that became a center of Jewish learning for all of this. So the Jews have always had a sense in which they never really returned from the Babylonian captivity, the Babylonian exile. Even though they were given permission to, so they didn't. So the Jews believe that in the last day that God will bring all of the Jews back in a new exodus out of all the different places in which they are now in exile. He believed, they believe that God will return, you know, the first part is he'll bring them out, that's what the exodus was. But then he will return them to the promised land, the land of Israel, and he will settle them appropriately, just like Joshua did, you know, to divide up the land and get, get them settled into an area that's appropriate to them. That, that God will do that in the last days. Then God will restore the house of David and the temple. You know, there you go. As soon as they get back, one of the very first things is, David, the, the house of David, that the promise was made to the house of David that a king would always sit on the throne for him. Or that, that his kingdom would not end, which means even though there's not a Davidic king right now, they believe it will be, you know, it's just in waiting. It's sort of, you know, in hiatus, but it will come back. And that the temple will be reestablished in Jerusalem. They believe that God will, out of the house of David, or line of David, will create a regent who is the Messiah. Regent means a king, a ruler. To lead the Jewish people and to bring about an age of justice and peace. They believe that all nations will, shortly after that's done, will establish, will recognize that the God of Israel is the one true God. And following that recognition, that God will resurrect all the dead, and he will then create a new heaven and a new earth, which will be the new Garden of Eden. It will be a return to the Garden. Now, does any of that sound familiar to you? Raising of the dead, and new heaven and new earth, and return to the Garden, and, you know, this is very much... The Christian expectation. We are, after all, grafted on to the rootstock of Judaism. We were adopted into the family and into the covenant of promise that was given to the Israelites. And so a lot of their expectations are the same ones we have. You might find it very interesting, and it's a side note here, that Islam also has very similar expectations. They expect, uh, we actually were at the dinner the, uh, was it last night? I guess it was last night. And somebody was asking me what I thought of the 12th Imam. And I didn't even want to get into it. <laughs> because I had a sense that they were going to be very, you know, sort of uh, rah-rah about this. The, the Islamic belief is that they're in the 900s, actually 800s, carrying into the 900s, there was the 12th heir to Muhammad was born. He was the 12th Imam. And when he was only five years old, he was taken into hiding for fear for his life. And while he was in hiding, that God actually... The, it's called the occultation. God hid him, not just from the people, but hid him like so that he did not. And the expectation in Islam is that the twelfth Imam will return. <coughs> Interestingly enough, he will return with Jesus, our Jesus, and that Jesus will affirm that the twelfth Imam is the is the final prophet, and it will um, usher in a period of peace, and where where. Whereas Judaism says everyone will recognize the God of Israel is the one true God, Islam says everyone will recognize that Islam is the one true religion, and it will enter in a, a, an era of peace and you know enlightenment, and the Imam will be the Messiah, so to speak. He is called the Mahdi, or sort of that's the ver the Arabic version of the chosen one. The difference, and it's a pretty significant difference, is the expectation in Islam is that before the the twelfth Imam, the Mahdi returns, that there will be a time of horrific. Uh, war and devastation and, and, and horrible and, and in fact one of the really scary things is that there are people like um, uh, Ahmadinejad who is the president of Iran who believes it's his responsibility to get ready for the Mahdi and that may involve nuclear war and so part of the real if you hear Israel the United States and everybody really getting their eyes you know wide open about uh, Ahmadinejad it's it's because it's believed that he thinks he may be the precursor to the Mahdi, and in order to get ready for the 12th Imam to show up, he may need to create world wars. He does. He does, he does think that. Yeah. I, he, I, I mean, that. he has said that, yes. Yeah. Uh, how far he'll go, you know, we, we have yet to see. But, even though the process between where we are and, and that point is different, there is a similar expectation on the parts of, there is an eschatological expectation on the parts of Jews, of Christians, and of, Is, of Muslims, that's not, you know, the end of Scene is not that far apart, except we believe it is that the Jews have missed the fact that it is Jesus who will be the Messiah. 
Um, and the, the Islamic belief is sort of like the 12th Imam is the point, and Jesus will just sort of be there to give him a reference. Um, so, all right, I want to talk now about well, what does this all mean to us for the next 20 minutes or so? One of the things that um, you will notice that you probably never heard Jews being really active in trying to convert Gentiles to Judaism. They don't have sort of the evangelistic fervor that we have. Well, there's a reason for that. Uh, and it has to do with what's, what would be called the Noahide or Noahic laws. The Noahide laws or the Noahide code. Genesis says that all people are descendants of Noah, of course. Everybody else was killed off. So Noah and his three sons and their, their families became the ancestors of all people. Well, um, Genesis says that since all people are descended from Noah, then there was a law code given to Noah, and we've got an Adam in here, because the Noahide code, or Noah code, actually takes what God said to Adam, and then what God said to Noah, and kind of merges them all into the Noahide law, or Noahide codes. In Judaism, non-Jews are not required to convert to Judaism, to be righteous. That's why they don't have a lot of evangelistic fervor. <coughs> Not only do they not expect non-Jews, that is Gentiles, to convert and follow uh, Jewish law, some of them are adamant that, it, that it's inappropriate for Gentiles to follow Jewish law. That the Jewish law, the mitzvot, the Torah, was given for the Jews, not for anybody else. But the, the standard Jewish faith, and there are always exceptions to this, but the, true, the main line of Jewish faith is that Gentiles are instead of following the Torah law, they are supposed to follow the seven laws of Noah, or Noahic law, which will assure them a place in the world to come. Um, the idea of, amongst Jews, is that there's such a thing as righteous Gentiles. When you read in the book of Acts, there are a number of references to God-fearing Gentiles who were at the Jewish synagogues when Paul visited and that sort of thing. Well, the expectation is that some of them may have been there because they were interested in maybe converting to Judaism, but whoever these God-fearing Gentiles were, they had decided that um, they didn't believe in the polytheism that was common in Greece, in Greek and Roman cultures. They believed that there must be a monotheism. And so those God-fearing Gentiles could either be people who were, who were seeking the monotheistic God of the Jews, because that's the only place you could go in the first century if you wanted to find one God. There wasn't anybody else doing that. They either wanted to uh, approach Judaism as a faith, or they wanted to um, recognize that it was one God. Even if they didn't want to become a Jew, they wanted to in some way try to follow that God in an appropriate way. Well, according to the Jewish tradition and beliefs, the way for a Gentile to do that is not necessarily to become a Jew, or not to follow the Jewish law, but rather to follow the, the laws of Noah, the seven laws of Noah, the Noahic Code or Noahic Law. And if a, if a Gentile does that, they become a righteous Gentile, then they inherit all of the blessings of the world to come, as they call it, the Olam Haba, which is, which is what I told you about a minute ago. All of this stuff, this end time stuff, that's what the world to come is to the Jews. That's the Olam Haba. And a righteous Gentile who follows the laws of Noah, the seven rules or laws of Noah, will inherit that just like a good Jew. So we got a much easier go of it than they do, because they got 613 rules. We have seven, <laughs> according to the Jewish. So again, this is a Jewish. This is the Jewish idea of law. Now, what are those seven laws? The first one, and these are going to sound familiar too: no idolatry. You can't worship any other idols except God. Second, no murder. Third, no theft. Fourth, no sexual immorality. Fifth, no blasphemy, speaking against the things of God. Um, sixth, kind of weird. No eating of the flesh taken from an animal that is still alive. And seventh, you must have just laws and you have to set up a court to maintain those laws. Now, if you go into um, Genesis 9, which is where Noah's story is, that's after, after the flood, you'll be hard-pressed to get all of these out of that. That's why up here I said Noah and Adam, because it's believed that when God said to, to Adam, you may eat of all the trees of the garden except this one, and, and then be fruitful and multiply and all that, that embedded in the comments to Adam and in the things of Noah, there's an assumption about a couple of these things. But it does say, no eating of flesh taken from hell is still alive. That's actually in, in the, the Noahic, that's what God said to Noah. It's also interesting if you go to, um, to Acts 15, 
after the Jerusalem Council, the Jerusalem Council was where the the high the the, the leaders of the Jewish Church, the, and they were all of the Christian Church rather, and they were all Jews at that time. They gathered together to talk about, well, what about these Gentiles who want to believe in Jesus? Do they have to follow the Jewish law? Do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to be prevented from eating wrong things, etc.? They decided they didn't. But the letter that they wrote, which James, the brother of Jesus, who was the head of the Jerusalem Council, wrote, with everybody's approval, says, basically, there are some people who have told you you have to become Jewish. You actually don't, but um, there are a few things that you shouldn't do. And it includes no idolatry. It includes not eating. It said not eating animals with blood in it. That's another way of saying don't eat part of an animal that's still alive. Which, uh, <laughs> well, could they have had blood sacrifices among the people there? Maybe they're just saying don't. Well, when they say don't don't eat an animal that has blood in it, I think they're saying that, that apparently in ancient cultures, one of the things they would do is they would hang animals up and they could cut one limb off at a time. The animal would still be alive. They didn't have refrigeration. So that's part of it, I think. You know, and that was considered cruel. This is this is concern for the, for the animals. Okay. Um, and it also says don't eat food sacrificed to idols. The reason why that says that in Acts 15, and if you read the passage, I think it's pretty clear, is not because doing those things would keep you out of favor with God. But doing those things would keep you out of favor with the Jews, who also needed to hear the truth of Jesus. Those were the things that were most visible, that the Jews had most trouble with about the Gentiles. So it was an issue of, of witness, not an issue of righteousness. Um, the James and the Jerusalem Council is saying, you don't have to be Jewish, but don't do these things, because if you do, you will so offend any Jews that see you doing that, they'll never listen to the good news about Jesus. Okay, That's why that's in there. So it wasn't a, do this and you, you won't be saved. It's, if you do this, you're going to keep somebody else from being saved. All right. But this, these are the rules that Judaism saw as being necessary for us Gentiles to follow. Now, that expectation is that you follow the rules and you get in kind of thing. And that's not our belief. So how do we Christians view, how historically and today do we view the Mosaic Covenant? And how should we? Um, because I have opinions about this. Uh, first, Christian tradition has always been consistent in maintaining that the requirements of the Noah Covenant are not binding on Christians. And again, I say here, see Acts 15. That's where the Jerusalem Council, the ruling council of the early church, said, no, you don't have to be circumcised and you know, refrain from eating pork and blah, 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 blah. The things that tells the, the Gentile believers in Jesus not to do have to do with witness not with righteousness. However, there have been various interpretations and views about how we should see, theologically, how we should see the Mosaic Covenant within the context of Christian theology. In other words, God gave, as I said earlier, the 615 mitzvah that are in the book, the Torah, the first five books that God gave to Moses, those were God's will. Those were God's words. God did tell them, do these things and don't do these things. So how do we interpret that? if we all agree that we no longer have to do all those things. Fair? I mean, that's the question for, for our review of the theology of the Old Testament law, of the Old Covenant, if you will. So I'm going to give you several different varieties, sort of in a spectrum, from one end to the other, in terms of how, how Christians have viewed this theologically. And this is not an effort to try to overly Christianize the issue, but this is part of the theology of the law, is for us to say, how do we theologically perceive the Old Covenant law now. One approach has been what's called New Covenant theology, and there's some others, but that's the, the dominant sort of school, that believes that the Old Covenant laws were completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and so therefore they have been canceled. The word that they use is abrogated, set aside in favor of the New Covenant law of Christ. In other words, the Old Covenant rules are gone. They're not there anymore for anybody, not even the Jews. They don't exist anymore. And set aside, abrogated. Okay. That's the New Covenant theology. Related to that, or similar to that, you've got dispensationalists. They just have kind of a twist on that same thing. Um, and, and sort of a twist and a footnote. <laughs> the dispensationalists believe that God has related to humanity, all of humanity, in different ways, in different times in history, or different eras in history. Um, the eras of history are called dispensations. That's where they get the name, dispensationalism. I'm going to flip over here because I want to be able to refer to something. 
Um, okay. Particularly, they believe that his relationship to the Jews in the Old Covenant, that is, from the time of Abraham until the time of Jesus, is very different than his relationship with the Christians in the New Covenant. In other words, at various times, God said, okay, I'm going to start doing this differently. Um, and the, the one thing about the dispensationalists, though, is they do believe that God, while he has set aside or stopped relating to the Jews in the way he did in the Old Covenant time, for today, there will come a time in, in the, the final days in which God then will come back and finish his relationship with the Jews. That there is a finishing of that, but for right now, the Old Covenant is not effective at all, even with the Jews. Now, dispensationalists, there are, there are dozens of different ways in which the dispensationalists break up history you know, into different time periods that say God had a different way of dealing with humanity. And those of you who have ever been to a dispensationalist church or you know, if you've ever had a Schofield Reference Bible, the Schofield Reference Bible is a dispensationalist Bible. Uh, and it's, it's one of the early um, reference or study Bibles. Um, if you've ever been in a church that, that, or a Sunday school class that taught dispensationalism, they love charts. They'll put up these charts, and there'll be a big cross right here, which is the start of the Christian you know, era. And, and you know, they'll have different all this stuff charted out, and names and lines and arcs and all kinds of stuff. Right, Carolyn? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I She's been in a church like that. Well, most dispensationalists, probably the largest group of dispensationalists, say that there are at least seven different dispensations or eras in which God had a different way of relating to humanity. The first one was the era of innocence, or dispensation of innocence prior to the fall of Adam. This is the Garden of Eden. The second would be the dispensation of conscience between Adam and Noah. The third would be the dispensation of government between Noah and Abraham. The fourth was the, would be the patriarchal rule between Abraham and Moses, when you've got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Then you've got the Mosaic Law from Moses all the way to Jesus. That's the longest one. Then you've got, or the longest one until the modern age. And then you have the dispensation of grace from um, the end of Revelation, or I'm sorry, from the, uh, the second chapter of Acts when the church starts, to um, Revelation, which is the age of grace. And then you get Revelation marks, uh, it's, it's not the writing of Revelation, but the events in Revelation would mark the start of the literal earthly 1,000 year millennial kingdom, that is the millennium. There are some dispensationalists that say there are three dispensations. Dispensation of the law with the Jews, the dispensation of grace with Jesus, then the dispensation of the kingdom after Jesus comes back. And there's everything in between. Okay? But they believe God has changed the way he relates to humanity. I don't buy it. Because it suggests, nowhere in scripture is there any suggestion that God has got deals differently per se. It never talks about different eras. To me, it's always felt like they're saying that God got to a certain point and went, well, darn, that's not working. I'm going to have to try something else. You know? There's no real rationale for why he would do it that way. And I don't think it's necessary to understand how this fits. But dispensationalism has been a large Protestant, even evangelical kind of movement. A lot of people still follow that. Okay. Um, and you'll stop me if you have any questions. The, uh, another is what's called the dual covenant Christians, who claim that the old covenant is still in force, but only for the Jews, and that the new covenant, oops, sorry, uh, push the button without meaning to. The new covenant, which is the covenant of Jesus, or the law of Jesus, has been provided for everyone who accepts Jesus, and both of them are going on at the same time, and always will. A lot of the dual covenant people believe that there will be different rewards for the Jews than for the Christians. And that gets kind of complicated. Um, but you see these, the, the differences as they're laying out here. Let me keep going. We're not done yet. One of the newest ones, which some of you, you probably know people who hold to this and don't even realize it, is called the theonomy, the view, uh, theonomic view. This is, starting in the 70s and 80s, there was a revival of the ideals of creating both civil and moral laws based on the Mosaic Covenant, or the Mosaic Law, with the belief that all, the entire law, continues to function with the same content and meaning as it always has, even for Christians, but that Christians now observe them differently. An example would be the, the law, the mandate, or the commandment in the Old Testament to sacrifice a lamb at Passover and recognition and all that, well, they would say that law is still fully applicable. It's, we still have to obey that law. The only thing that that has been done by Jesus. You see the kind of playing that they're doing there? 
you know, the laws still are in effect, but uh, we don't have to observe them in exactly the same way because some of what Jesus did. If you, um, and again, I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but I, I think you've probably seen this manifest in ways you might not realize with uh, um, when Carol and I were in Tennessee. It's like all these yards we drive past have these signs that say, Obey the Ten Commandments. Right? People who vote for political candidates based upon whether or not they think they are going to, you know, commit or implement the Christian beliefs into the legal process. Um, this is a this started as a movement in the 70s and 80s, and I think a lot of people who, who believe in that don't realize that there actually was kind of an intentional movement to try to take the Old Testament law and make it the law of the land here, here being U.S., Canada, wherever else it is. Um, and there are problems with that. There's a reason why I believe Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. He was telling me don't confuse the two. And yet the theonomy movement is an effort to try to do exactly that. But with regard to the law, the theonomists would say the law is still fully in effect. And we have to obey it all. Some of it got covered by something Jesus did, but the Old Testament covenant, the Old Covenant law still is applicable to us today. Okay? Us as Christians as well as everybody else. Then you have the Catholic theologians, starting with Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, um, have maintained that when you look at the Old Testament law, it's all not one thing. That there actually are at least three different parts to the Old Covenant law, or Mosaic law, the Torah. That there are moral laws that are part of it, there are ceremonial laws that are part of it, and then there are judicial or courtly laws. And that Christians still do have an obligation to follow the moral aspects of the law, but we are no longer under the obligation to follow either the ceremonial or the judicial. Meaning, we still are under the rules. Don't kill, don't steal, you know, don't commit adultery, don't lie about your neighbor, you know, don't covet your neighbor's stuff, you know, don't, don't desire to have anything you don't have a right to. Uh, but, and, and the rules with regard to how we, how we act toward God still in effect, because those really are divine moral laws. But we no longer, it's no longer an issue for us that we can't eat pork, or you know, that we have to dress in a certain way, we have to have curls, we have to wear you know, tassels at the four corners of our clothing, and all of that kind of stuff. That those, those were part of the ceremonial or judicial law of the Jews. We are no longer under that obligation, but we are still under the obligation of the moral law. Okay? And that God gave the other part of it in order to help create a sense of nationhood amongst the Jews, which is no longer applicable to us, and that's why that's not something we need to do anymore. But the moral law is still true. And earlier I said that there's the first level of law that the Jews perceive when they break it up into three, there's one level that is the laws that are obvious, you know, self-evident. Well, that's what the moral law is. There is, it's, unless you're a psychopath, it's self-evident that killing people is not good. All right? Um, Related to that, actually, and you might be shocked by this, a descendant of that, is covenant theology. Covenant theology was articulated, perhaps most specifically, by John Calvin, who is the founder of Reformed theology, which is the source from which Presbyterianism comes, since we are a Presbyterian church. Um, John Calvin agreed with the Catholics, that is, with Aquinas and the one since Aquinas, that Christians are obligated to obey only the moral aspects of the Mosaic Law. So he agreed with that part, that we are not under obligation to follow ju the judicial or the ceremonial law. But uh, Calvin went further in terms of identifying that covenant, the idea of covenant, was the framework under which God had related to all people at all times. So in that regard, he, uh, I think Calvin helped explain that God didn't just change his mind. The first relationship that he had with the Hebrew people, with Abraham, did not involve a law. In fact, this is something I've, I've talked about a lot in, in Bible studies and in sermons and things like that. When God called Abraham and he said, I want you to be my guy, and you will be the father of many, you will be the father of many nations even, you will be my people and I will be your God. That was the, that was the deal. There weren't any rules. The only thing later, he said, as a sign of our agreement, and it was a sign. It wasn't actually a rule so much as it simply was a visible commitment to it. Then your men, males have to be circumcised so that you will carry in your flesh the fact that you are committed to this covenant of relationship with me. All right? But there weren't any rules. There wasn't any, you have to do this, you can't do that. 
you must do this, you know. For 500 years, between Abraham and Moses, the only rule was, your males need to be circumcised as a mark of the fact that you are my people and I am your God. Okay? Then Moses, there's the Exodus, they come out of, of captivity in Egypt and Mount Sinai, and God gives the law to Moses, 613 rules. Well, 611 to Moses, two of them were be fruitful, multiply, and then circumcision given to Abraham. Um, and that became the Mosaic Law. But Calvin would maintain that that was an affirmation in detail of God's original covenant. His covenant, because it actually says in the Mosaic Law, you do these things and I will be your God and you will be my people. That it really was the same commitment relationship. And that when Jesus came, Jesus, again, affirmed the covenant commitment that God had to his people, except he opened it up that any would, who would come to God through the relationship that was offered in his son, Jesus Christ, would be heirs to that covenant, that new law of Jesus. Now, so we're sort of stuck trying to say, well, why did God not have laws from Abraham for 500 years from Abraham to Moses? And then he had laws for 1,400 years from Moses to Jesus, and then he doesn't have laws anymore. What's up with that? I struggle for a long, long time, several of you have heard me say this, to try to figure out a good, ex a good way to explain how I saw that. It finally struck me one day. If Carolyn and I were to adopt um, a 12-year-old boy and bring him into our home and say, we love you, we want you to be our son, you're part of our family, doesn't matter that you, you know, weren't born to us, you're family. There's no rules other than Love us, we'll love you, we'll be family. Okay. And that goes great for about six years, five years maybe, 17. And our adopted son starts acting out, taking money out of Carolyn's purse, staying out late at night. We found a bottle of uh, Jack Daniels in his room and he took out of his mother's <laughs> cupboard. No. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, and so, and so there's things. The idea of just being a loved part of the family isn't, isn't sufficient anymore. And so we say, okay, wait a minute. We've got to head set some house rules here. There's got to be some regulations that you have to live up to. There are things that you can't do. You can't stay out beyond a certain hour. You can't do this. You can't do that. And there's certain things you have to do. You have to start taking more responsibility around here. You have to start taking out the garbage. You have to do clean up your room, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So we institute those rules in order to make sure that violations are curbed. And then, after you know, two or three more years, young adult, we go, okay, you're still living at home, which is fine, <laughs> but we don't need to have house rules anymore. You're, you know, you're at the point where you can make your own decision about when you're gonna come in, you know, and you don't have to take out the trash. That's kind of silly for a 20-year-old to have to do now, and et cetera that we are back to the place of saying our, you're, you've proven that the only obligation that we have to each other now specifically is not to do chores and to, to have you know to have curfew and all that, but just to be family, to love each other, to respect each other. That's exactly the pattern in the Old Testament. God's relationship with Abraham was one in which he said, I am adopting you as my child. You're my guy, I'm your God. Then, after 500 years, the Israelites... Had, had demonstrated pretty clearly that they had forgotten about God. And so he presented them, even, I, who knows what God would have done when Moses went back up on the mountain, who knows what details he would have given them, except for the fact that the Israelites are already down there worshiping a golden calf. And so God is saying, okay, we're going to have to have some pretty strict rules here, guys, if you're going to live up to what it means to be part of my, to be my family. And so here are the rules. These are the house rules. And they continued to live under those house rules for the next 1,400 years. And it came to the point where God sent his son Jesus, and the, the, the statement clearly was, you are so loved, you are family, if you just continue to demonstrate your love for God by loving me, that's all it's going to take. You've grown to the point that that's not necessary anymore. Mm -hmm. To me, that makes, that makes sense. And I think that's consistent with what Calvin said, in that all of these various ways in which God has related through what we call the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, and everything else, is all just one covenant. And we can, we can break it down and say there was a covenant of grace, there was a covenant of redemption in Jesus, there was a covenant of works that was Adam and everything else. But the bottom line is they all really reflect the same thing. 
all three of those time periods, just like the, the, the analogy of the three time periods we would relate to an adopted child, doesn't change the fact that this is our child and we're his family. We love him, it's just sometimes it was necessary, given the way that child was acting, that there needed to be certain rules. Okay. And covenant theology, I believe, gives you that framework, because it says all of it basically is one covenant. It's just been reflected in different ways based upon the demands that the people made in terms of how they were going to be in relationship with God. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Questions about that? That's my own analogy. So if you don't agree with it, that's okay. I mean, you're not violating John Calvin. <laughs> uh, any other questions about any of this in terms of the theology? And so where we end up is we, meaning I, and I believe the one that makes most sense, and I, I came to this before I really understood it to be Reformed theology, is that the covenant relationship that God had with his people, which got reflected in terms of different kinds of uh, expectations along the way for good reasons, it's always been the same covenant. It hasn't changed. God still loves the Jews, and God has a special plan for the Jews. I mean, that's in Romans. It's not just in the Old Testament esch eschatology. It's in the, in the Christian eschatology, too, that God still has a plan for the, Rome, for the Jews. So, um, you know, we have great hope and expectation in that. John? Um, th this covenant that Calvin is talking about, this, this overarching covenant, um, in the Old Testament there would be um, evidences of that covenant, uh, circumcision, uh, mm -hmm. later on the Sabbath. Right. What would those be today? Would that be like baptism and maybe the Sabbath and the Lord's Supper or loving one another? What, what would be that, that sign of the covenant? I, 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 well, we don't have the same, um, again, the fact that Jesus, the aspects of those things which were ritual or ceremonial okay, um, are no longer binding on us. I mean, we do have the sacraments. <coughs> are uh, samples of the covenant. They are the, the Reformed definition of a sacrament is the outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And so we do have the, the sacraments, which we continue to practice. You know, we, we were baptized once, but we continue to practice communion. So those are visible um, examples of our covenant commitment and the grace that God has given us because of his covenant love for us through Jesus Christ. Uh, beyond that, we don't have the same kind of sort of permanent marks that circumcision was or that, you know, that otherwise. But that's because, again, whether you want to say that the covenant is just, there's different terms, it's the same covenant, but there's sort of different terms under which we are living to fulfill it. Doesn't require circumcision, doesn't require, require obedience to dietary laws or any of that sort of stuff. But I believe that fundamentally it all still boils down, boils down to I am your God and you are my people. I want to be in relationship with you, but I have now fulfilled the opportunity to do that through my son Jesus. Bill? I was just going to say, I was raised in a dispensational type church also. Yeah. And uh, I see the word covenant is very positive for me personally. For a dispensation doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And it's sort of, I, and maybe I just missed it, but, and I don't claim to be an expert on dispensationalism by any means. I mean, I know quite a bit about it, but I'm not an authority. I'm not a theologian that's dispensationalist. But, I never have heard any kind of good explanation for why would God do it that way? Why would he completely stop, you know, at one period in time, he completely stops relating to humanity in one way and starts all over with a completely different idea. I never really have understood that. It doesn't, it doesn't seem consistent with what we believe to be the nature of God, a God who does not change, a God who doesn't really change his mind. Right. And I know it says in places God repented or God, and I think what it is is that, you know, God gave us some rope and once we hanged ourselves with it, God then pointed out, you know, I gave you a chance. I don't think it's that God figured out he made a mistake, it's that he gave us the opportunity we made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Sierra? Um, I was just thinking when you guys were talking about like the an outward showing of like the covenant that we have with Christ now, it talks about how, you know, because that's like to show other people that you're in covenant with him. And, and in the New Testament, it talks about by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love, if one, you love one of them. Yeah. So maybe that's like the present day. Yeah, I think that's good. Uh, it, it's called, I mean, the scripture talks in a couple of places, Paul talks about in Galatians and Corinthians, about the law of Christ. Meaning, and he says, there's a new law, um, and it's the law of Christ. Well, the, when Jesus said, a new, a new law I give to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you what? 
Love one another. So the law of Christ, uh, many people interpret, and I think fairly, that the law of Christ is love one another. That's what it boils down to. And Jesus said the greatest commandment is love God. The second greatest commandment, which is likened to it, bumping right up against it, is love, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. So this, this is really the, the, the sign, you know, of, of our, our commitment to the covenant of Jesus Christ. Yeah. To confirm what she said in Colossians, I, I was thinking of this, Paul says in Colossians 2, um, talking about the true circumcision, and he says, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by hand, human hands. Uh, your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having right. been buried with him in baptism. So there's a spiritual circumcision. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Appreciate it, guys. Let me. Um, there is no reading for next week. You get a break. We finished reading the Anderson book. Or you should have. If you haven't, you get a chance to catch up. Um, and I will be getting those notes out to you as quickly as I can. Thanks, everybody. Let me know if you have any questions.